Good morning again. If you have your Bibles, open them to uh, Matthew 5 as we continue our study. First, I just thank you, church, for your love and care and just response last week. Um, yeah, when you're overwhelmed by God's goodness and graciousness and mercy and love, and it's been just an overwhelming sense of that uh, from for the last you know number of months, uh, it's amazing how God just does a mighty work and yeah, it's just incredible. So I appreciate your guys' response to that. But also, um, whenever I start to get emotional, I actually try to do math in my head, is what somebody suggested years ago. Um, apparently, five times five, we got real hard real quick. And I just could not think of the answer. I know it's 30, right? I do algebra. <laughs> so, sorry, Rhonda, that probably made you cringe. Five times five being 30. But... Anyway, I just, I do, I thank you for that, but it's, uh, man, it's just, God, it's just phenomenal, and, and when you come to the depths of who he is and what he can do in your life and how he can change things and work on us, and even as believers, we go through those seasons, um, man, man, he's a good God. So, we're going to walk through the passage today. We've got uh, divorce and oaths are the main things, but the first thing, obviously, is going to talk about sin. I'm going to actually recap the end of the last one, just because of the fact that, again, there is grace and mercy, and that's, that's so deep and so rich and so phenomenal, and that's there for us. Like, if you're not a believer, there, that is found in Christ, through salvation in Christ. If you know him, that relationship with him and a deepening of a relationship with him brings those things to an even greater fruition in your life if we truly pursue him. But at the end of all these things, whether it's Anger and lust, murder and adultery, if it's divorce, if it's oaths, if it's anything that's done wrong and out of the other, other wrong motives, it is sin. And it's, it's sin, and we are sinners who sin. We don't sin and become sinners. I actually had that conversation with somebody this week that uh, didn't, didn't really understand that ever. That, you know, it wasn't that, well, I sinned this one time, so therefore I became a sinner. Like, we are born in iniquity. We are sinners, therefore we sin. And we, even as believers... We'll continue to do so, but what is our mindset towards that sin? So I'm going to reread, and I think I've actually got the verses up there for you. I'm just going to reread uh, verses 29 and 30, and we're going to deal with the sin issue a little bit before we get into the other things. So verse 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Let's pray before we begin. God, we thank you for this morning. We want to be faithful to your word and your word only. Lord, I pray uh, that you would teach us, Spirit, be the teacher to us. Uh, bring the words alive to us. Change hearts where hearts need to be changed. Break hearts where hearts need to be broken. Uh, encourage us, Lord. Uh, restore our joy, all the things that only you can do, God. I pray that those things are true in you and only of you. Uh, we pray again for your word this morning and, and, and let it be what we hear and what we know. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, number one, the sin is the issue. It's the issue for every aspect of everything and everything that we deal with and all the stuff that we wrestle through. Sin is the issue. And God hates Sin. I think that we don't get the drasticness, the, the intensity of the fact that God hates sin. And there's, if we could think of a loathes, if we could think of anything that's deeper, worse, more intense than that, it's what God feels towards sin. Can't be around it, can't look at it, can't, uh, honestly just can't be a part of it. And so because of that, Jesus, remember I said this last week, uses grotesque imagery because of how grotesque sin should be. And so, yes, gouge out your eyes. He's not causing, calling for mutilation like we talked about last week, but he's calling for us to take it seriously, right? It, it's, it's something that we should be so against. And the thing is, is that Jesus also hates sin, but also weeps at it. Um, like Lazarus, when he goes to the tomb, it's not just that he lost his friend. He, his friend died because of what sin did when it was brought into the world. He cries and weeps over Jerusalem, knowing what's wrong with Jerusalem. Jesus weeps and realizes the grotesqueness. And again, it's such an inner hatred towards sin. And no part of the Trinity is okay with this. And if that's the case, because I think there are some people out there, and there's actually some theology taught, that you know, God is here and Jesus is somewhere here and the Spirit's somewhere down here. And the Spirit does live with inside of us, but the Spirit's just kind of there to help us as like a, a, uh, you know, a, a mental help or a, 
a guide along the way sort of a thing. The Trinity is the Trinity. They are all co-equal together. They are all eternal together. And the Spirit does live with inside of us. And if it does live inside of us and it is co-equal with the Father, and if we read in Scripture, because again, every part of the Trinity hates, then the, the Spirit that lives within me hates the sin that is in, in me and wants to get rid of the sin that is in me. And there's no other standard that we should live by or look at things by because, again, the Pharisees are living their life out through all these things and they're going, don't commit adultery, while at the same time never having an issue with lust, never having an issue with the other things, obeying the letter of the law but not the heart and spirit of what the law was meant to be. And so we oftentimes do that as well where we may follow the letter of the law or follow the letter of what we think the Bible is talking about but not the genuineness and the depth of what God means for us to truly live by. And so that's why he gives us a standard. Be holy, for I am holy. I am the Lord your God. Be holy as I am holy. And this applies to all sin. Last week we were talking most specifically about murder and adultery and lust and uh, anger and all of those things. But it applies to every sin that you can imagine. So when Jesus, when he says to rip out your eye, it means to get rid of anything that may lead to sin. The eye is everything, and this is something I said last week, so I just want to rehash this. The eye is everything inside of me that tries to satisfy me with everything but God. Anything that could lead down that path, stop playing with it as if you can control it. We can't control our sin. And don't tiptoe the line believing you can stop it any time you want and no one will get hurt. The heart moves the eye and the eye inflames a sinful heart. Put it to death daily. That's the call for our sin is to put it to death daily and have such a hatred and an intensity for it that we want to see it put to death. It's not a cute puppy. It's not to be played with. It's not a toy. It is literally the most grotesque thing that you can possibly imagine and then add infinity on top of it because that's what it costs you. And the first wrong step is this. This isn't going to lead to anything further. No matter what your sin is, we've all been in that place. Yeah, but I won't go any further than this with this. And then you find yourself stumbling down the path of sin right into the thing that you thought you would never end up in. No matter what sins you struggle with the most, we must hate them. We must hate them. I mean, do you take your sin seriously? Do you take walking the line seriously? Do you get to a point where now whenever I have these issues and I'm getting close to that line that I go, no, no more. Number one, it is dangerous. Number one, it doesn't glorify God. And two, it's dangerous for me to go there. The Pharisees and the scribes had redefined the law to better fit their suited needs. Like, well, let's rewrite this or let's let's have the letter of the law up here, but let's be okay with these things that kind of trickle down out of that that aren't necessarily the letter of the law. And unfortunately, I think a lot of us strong believers to weak believers, to people who pretend to be believers, do that with God's word all the time. It says this, but not really. I I think I can. And it all goes back to the devil saying, did God really say? If we treat our life in Christ with, did God really say? Whether you say that out loud to yourself or in your inner part, or you just let that be a resounding thing in your sin... Did he really say that's a bad sin? Did he really say? All you're doing is echoing the evil one. Sin takes bits and pieces. Very rarely will sin just devour us. I mean, there are some times where we, I, I know of some people who literally fell into, fell into, it's ridiculous, who went forward with sin that they were not struggling with before and just became an issue with them. I know that that does typically, uh, that doesn't typically happen though. It's sin takes bits and and pieces of us. And then eventually over time, if you take enough of those bits and pieces, it devours us. If we don't go to war with our sin, we will be consumed with our sin. And the thing is, is that it's really hard to love Christ when we don't hate our sin. It's really hard to love Christ truly when we don't hate our sin. The reason that there's an even deeper, and I've had times in my life where there's you know, there's these different periods and whatever else. Maybe you go have the same things. And then there's a, a depth of growth in Christ. And there's this amazing just how you see him move and work. And then there's times in our lives and ebbs and flows and things. 
but there has never been a greater time where I love the Lord more than I do right now, which should be all of us as we grow in our sanctification process. And there's never been a time in my life where I've hated my sin more than I do right now. And I hope down the road that that continues to be the case in a greater sense. But that's got to be our hearts. If I really want to love Christ, I really have to hate my sin. And however, if we realize the enormity of our sin, truly confess our sin, truly repent. Again, that means to turn and walk away, not be Lot's wife who's like, one last look. Because that last look back at your sin when you say you repented, but you continue to look back at it, is only going to draw your eye and then your heart back to it again. So if we truly understand the enormity of our sin, truly confess and repent our sin, and throw ourselves upon the boundless, boundless love and mercy of God, you'll be forgiven. Not just sorry it happened. Not just sorry that you got caught for something. Repentant, poor in spirit, changed because of the mercy and love of God, and then the power of the Spirit within us to root out those things. Because this is where the goofiness of society comes, right? You share this with people, you talk about stuff. You can't say anything about my lifestyle. You can't say anything about this. You can't, you, you can't talk about sin. Sin means that I did something wrong. Yes, and so did I. Well, Jesus never condemned anybody. What? And even when he doesn't, the lady caught in adultery, the woman at the well, a number of issues where he clearly had the right to go. He says what to them? Go and sin no more. He does forgive. He doesn't condemn necessarily in those cases, but he says to them every single time, every single time, go and sin no more. It's not a, just try harder. Paul Washer says it this way. If you know anything about Paul Washer, woo. The Christian life is one of trusting in Christ, struggling against sin and striving for the prize. There will be times of pruning, stagnation, and even regress. Yet, over the full course of time, there will be advances in sanctification and fruitfulness will be evident. There's freedom in Christ. You can't just sit around in the hope that freedom comes, though. Thank you, veterans, for serving. I mean, it's, it's an honor to get to meet a number of them. My uh, grandparents were, were veterans. My grandpa, one of my grandpas was actually at Pearl Harbor when it was attacked. Um, he, has some, he had some insane stories. If we went around and we hoped all throughout our history as America that somebody would do something, I just, I hope freedom happens somehow. It never would have happened. The same thing is true in our life with Christ and from our sin. It won't just happen. We have to pursue him. We have to read his word. Don't tell me God is silent when your Bible's closed. Pray. Pray, pray. There's an even deepening relationship with Christ. Speak and listen to him. And love Jesus with your whole heart. And that's going to be an ever-changing, growing thing for you. But as best as you know how in the place that you are, love Jesus the best that you can with your whole heart. And if you truly do, he will reveal even more so how that is possible. But there is freedom in him if we pursue him, know him, long for him. And in him there is forgiveness, and in him there is joy and peace. Like there is, I could speak to it, God answers prayer, God forgives, God loves, God restores. God is amazing. So our second point, before we went into all that, our second point is divorce. I'm going to read the passage for the divorce part, and then we'll talk about that. But it says, starting in verse 31, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. What do we do with that? I mean, what do we do with that? Essentially, a lot of churches look at that and go, well, we're not going to touch that one. If... if 
if 50% of the society is divorced, we're not going to touch a passage that deals with divorce. Well, guess what? 99% of men struggle with lust, and we went there. So we're going to go ahead and deal with this also. All right? Divorce is so rampant in our society. It is something the lost world treats as something that just happens. It's just something that's there. And again, if you're divorced and you're in here, there's no attack here. There, there's, no, there's no looking at this and going, well, th- if you did this, and this is, then, then this is this. Hear this with love. Hear the words of the Lord. Hear the truth behind all of these things. But it's so rampant in our society that I was talking to a friend who's going through a divorce, and his son told him, when, his, when he told his son what was happening, his son said, that's no big deal. Most of my friends, actually, parents are divorced. Even to our children, it's becoming such a laissez-faire thing that it's, well, most people are, so it's really not that big of a deal. And we've heard the statistics. We know it's a major issue in society, but it's also a major issue in the church as well. Many churches want to skip past it and not deal with it. Many churches want to skip past a lot of things in Scripture because it's just hard. It really is. It may be awkward. It may cause sensitivity issues. But the gospel of Jesus concerns every aspect of our life. The gospel of Jesus concerns every aspect of our life. We should never say any passage is not worth studying or is too sensitive to study. In fact, we should drill down on those in our own life because we can root out through his word, the power of his word, the power of prayer, the power of the Holy Spirit, those things in us. In the world, we have our daily bread. In the word, sorry, we have our daily bread. We have everything provided through clear teaching and instruction for every aspect of our life. This is not a dead text. This is not a text that we look at and go, there's parts in here that I really, really like, and there's parts in here I don't. Let's see, I'm going to unhitch this part and look at this part and believe this part. I'm going to create my own religious narrative from Scripture that I believe in. No. From front to back, jot and tittle. All true, all his word, and all relevant and good for our teaching, rebuke, and overall change. Let's just understand that first. It is also really misunderstood, this part of scripture as well. I mean, if you ask most people in the church, any church, you know, what does the Bible really say about divorce? What does Jesus say about divorce? What what does this say about divorce? And you'll actually get different answers. I've actually done it in the past. You'll get different answers. And the thing is, we don't really know what it's saying. And then we come to this, we're like, well, whoever marries a, a divorced woman commits adultery. Well, what does that even mean? So we're going to approach this passage asking ourselves three questions, basically. And we're, we, we kind of did this in the previous passages, and we're going to do this in the next little bit. But we're going to ask ourselves three questions, and these are the three questions. What did the law of Moses really say? What did the Pharisees and scribes actually teach? And what did Jesus himself teach? And we're going to take that approach for both divorce and oaths. So remember, Jesus' words in uh, Matthew 5, 18 through 20. So we need to make sure we remember this when we're talking about the fact that he's, he's preaching and teaching to his disciples and believers. But he's also addressing the people in the back, right? The whole ladder for the people in the back. He says this in... 18, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And that doesn't mean they still get into heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So he said he didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill the law. He also warns that if anyone teaches a lesser truth and passes that on to other people, they are under condemnation. You don't get to go, yeah, here it is. That's why when you hear these false prophets, false teachers, false people that are on TV, or that you read, or you follow, or you think are great, and are teaching lesser truths or false teachings, they are to be condemned and called out. Because they're leading so many people astray. Their buildings are full of people hearing non-truths about scripture, and it's going to be a nasty judgment on those people. So meaning that if you hold the letter of the law, basically they're like, if you hold the letter of the law, 
but you break the heart of the law is what Jesus is saying, you are guilty. And the law of Moses, so what did the law of Moses really say? Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, and if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband, who divorced her, is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land, and the Lord your God is giving you an inheritance. That's the, that's, that's the main scripture that people, that, that if we look at the law, there's other ones that kind of briefly talk about it as well, but that's the main one. And the issue for that time period, the reason the law was written, the reason that Moses has the law, is given the tablets, but also then the law is written through all of this, is because they had just come out of Egypt. They were not a free people before. They had never been one cohesive group of people under the hand of God. They have lived under this pagan society. They had followed their rules. They had done all these things. And now God is saying, that is no good. There is a way to live to honor and glorify me, and this is how to do it. So they were going from chaos and sin and paganism, and even as they wandered throughout the wilderness, they were going through chaos Sin and paganism, as, as God calls them to this new way of life, the law is necessary. It's relevant and important for all aspects of it. And people were divorcing in the pagan society and this, it, whatever, however you wanted to. I mean, literally, it could be, I don't really like her anymore. And you could divorce her. And women and children were abandoned all the time and to fend on their own because they just decided, I don't like her anymore. And while this sounds silly, where you're like, if it displeases, displeases him and something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce. But what this is, is it's trying to draw a deeper attention to the fact that divorce isn't just a, gone, I'm divorcing you, I'm done with you. It takes another step, and then even beyond that, if you divorce your wife and send her off and, she mar- and she, you're done with her, once that divorce happens and she, starts, she marries someone else, you have no ability to get back together with that woman. There's a greater sense here because that happened all the time. They would send them off while they were displeased with them, and then they would pursue them and bring them back. No more. That's not how we treat our marriages. That's not how we treat the women and men that we marry. That's not the goal of marriage And so because of that, it's a more serious thing. So for us reading this, this seems crazy, but for them it was a big deal that God made it such a different mindset. And the law was necessary to bring that right worship. But notice in this law, though, it doesn't deal with adultery. Why? Because under the law, adultery is punishable by death. So what it does here is it says if the marriage has an issue, then you can get divorced. The marriage was not ended by divorce. The marriage was ended by death in this sense. But now the purpose is that they are trying to change the way that they view it. I mean, if, he, if the man wanted any excuse whatsoever, he could do it. And this is a ridiculous way to think about divorce, but it was drawing a sense of what was needed. But really all that was happening here and the reason it was necessary and the reason that the Pharisees were abusing it was all based on lust and passion that led to further sin. So what was the Pharisees thought or taught? They taught that the law commanded and encouraged a man to divorce his wife under certain conditions. In fact, if she just becomes displeasing to you, she stops to do the things that she's supposed to do. If she does certain things a certain way, then you actually have the right and you're almost expected to divorce that woman. This was the idea of how they had produced under this original note and under this original law that you were actually okay with it and not only okay with it but you're encouraged to do so and Jesus says no that's not true of the law at all there's nowhere in it that says that that's the truth and Pharisees and teachers essential demanded in their reading of the law that they get to keep that right they saw it as a human right as men to be able to do that and divorce in that way What a stupid way to think. And even so far, if a man ceased to like her, he could send her. And he didn't want to deal with the sin. That's what the Pharisees really had the issue with, dealing with sin. 
Well, it's only a sin if you go this far. No, it's not. The heart of it is that you want to live in your lust, your passions, your desires. Your eye is pursuing things outside of God, and therefore that eye has caused you to sin. Stop it. They didn't view the law with any respect from the glory of God and the heart of God. That's the problem. That's us too. We don't view the word of God from the glory of God and the heart of God and to follow God and pursue him as he has called us to do it. It's here's some instruction for us. No, it's for his glory that we live this way. It's for his glory that we don't do these things. And it's for his glory that we live out our life in such a way and do the things that he's called us to do. And again, in his glory, it is then for our good. All issues that they had with the law were man-made issues, not God issues. So Jesus, what did he teach? As usual, teaches it's a, Jesus teaches it's a much bigger issue. He addresses the fornication and unfaithfulness as the only grounds for divorce. He calls them out here and says, if you divorce for anything except for sexual immorality, he makes her commit adultery. This is a pretty heavy thing. He addresses the fornication and unfaithfulness, and he presses it again, actually, in Matthew 19. In Matthew 19, he is being uh, approached by these people. He's being approached by the Pharisees, and I don't have it on the screen, but I'm just going to kind of read it to you. And they ask him, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And Jesus says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, then why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. He teaches a totally different thought process than what they had had. He goes beyond the law. All the way back to Genesis 2.24, where he says, created a man, male and female, they're going to leave their households and they're going to become one flesh together. This isn't a civil contract. This isn't a sacrament. This isn't some flippant thing that now our society has made marriage to be. One flesh is the theme of marriage and divorce all throughout scripture. Every passage deals with it, deals with the idea of one flesh. And the law of Moses says that because of your hardness of heart. Jesus says, the law of Moses says it's because of your hardness of heart. But from the beginning, it was not so. So the two become one flesh is significant here. When we consummate our marriage, when we come together, when we are married to each other and we begin that bond and we enter into that relationship, we do become one flesh. Not just in physical attraction and physical intimacy, but with everything. Our joys, our sorrows, our our life together, the things that we do, the things that we decide, the raising our kids, that all becomes one flesh bonded together under that, under that covenant relationship with each other. And the problem was that they didn't see it as that. They saw it as we kind of live together, we hang out together, and if it doesn't work out together, then we'll just stop living together and divorce. Physical adultery usually occurs after much mental adultery has happened already. To commit adultery or be unfaithful, one must think it, plan it, and persuade yourself it is justified, often while hiding it. If someone in the relationship were to go outside of that relationship and have a relationship with another that one flesh is broken. The thing that bonded you together all for, forever under that covenant of marriage is now broken because someone has chosen to go outside of the relationship and the bond has been made with another person. And therefore adultery takes place. And that's why Jesus says that it's okay at this moment because that bond that held us together that actually that we should never divorce or come apart from has been broken by someone in the marriage. He doesn't say you have to have a divorce. That never comes out of his mouth, and it's never anywhere in Scripture. It says you have, you can divorce, but he doesn't say you have to divorce. So the link is gone. The one flesh no longer obtains. Divorce is legitimate. If you divorce outside of that, you're actually causing 
the one you divorced into adultery. So if neither person, this is why the scripture says this, if neither person enters a, an adulterous relationship outside, you just decide you've grown tired of each other and you divorce, the bond was never broken. So the bond continues until that person goes off and marries someone else and has relationship with them. Now the bond has been broken and that is the adultery is what scripture is talking about. Nobody deals with that. Nobody wants to talk about that part of scripture. But that's what Jesus means when he talks about if you divorce them other than adultery, whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery or a divorced man if otherwise happens. That is why marriage should not be entered into lightly. It is a deeply important thing. Jesus is not saying that anyone must divorce. He is saying this is grounds for it. For some, the wound is so deep. For some, they're completely unrepentant. And for others, divorce does happen because of these things. But however, with every single sin, and I, I'm not calling out your spot. I'm not calling out your situation. I'm not calling out your past. Whatever your past, whatever your present, whatever your future, every sin, the goal is repentance, the goal is forgiveness, the goal is renewal in the Lord, and the goal is restoration. But how? The wound is so deep. Only through the Lord. Literally, only through the Lord. I know it's a sensitive topic. I know there are some in here that have been impacted by divorce, either you've personally gone through it or your family has, and I don't want to minimize it in any way, and I'm not calling you a bad person because you've gone through this. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching through what the word says, but Christ is the only one who can heal the pain that you've gone through. He's the only one that can heal the sorrow. He's the only one that can heal your marriages. He's the only one that can heal the divorcee. He's the only one that can heal the widow. He's the only one that can heal the broken heart. So I want you to know that if you are in that situation or you've gone through that situation or you're wrestling through the situation or whatever might be going on, he's the only hope you need because he's the only hope we truly have. Amen. So we come to the third thing of oaths. We're going to take the same approach under oaths with, as we did, we're going to do what did the law say, what did the Pharisees and scribes teach, and what did Jesus himself teach. And we'll get through this one a little bit quicker, but I want to read 33, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool, or Jerusalem, for it is a city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no, anything more than this comes from evil. So we have an interesting view of oaths. I mean, we just talked about the, the most significant oath, the most significant covenant, the most significant agreement that we'll ever make in our marriages. That, that to me, is the most significant agreement that we'll ever come to in our lives. And we have an interesting view of them because a lot of times, even in our oaths to other people or our agreements with other people, we, we tend to look for loopholes. And that's an issue. I mean, I was taught growing up, though, a person, a man, it was always said a man because I'm a guy, a man is only as good as his word. Maybe some of you have heard that growing up. I heard it a lot. A person is only as good as the word. If the person consistently lies to you, that person is going to consistently never be in my life. I can't trust you. I can't be around you. Why would I want to be around you? Can I, say what, can I trust what you say is true? If not, you're really not worth your salt. So I move on from that. As believers, we must even more so be people of our word. We must even more so be people that take their word and their deeds seriously. Like the song, may, may my deeds be even more than my words. Like, may, may I live this out more than I even say it. But everything that I say, let it be true. And people are watching us. I noticed how you did this. People do not take seriously their word or deeds because it doesn't really matter to them. And we must be above reproach and there has to be something different about us. In the way that we do business, in the way that we talk to people, in the way that I agree to things. If I say it, I'm going to show up. I'm going to do it unless something crazy happens. But we should live by our word that we say what we're going to do. And as Christians, this is so true of us. It has to be. Because if I can't trust you as a human being for your actions and your words to me, what you say you're going to do... Why would I ever trust you about this thing called 
Christ, this person called Christ and salvation and forgiveness found in him. I can't even trust you as a human. How can I trust the Lord? So we must be above approach. So what does the law of Moses say? Again, people in their sin and chaos, they're outside of the the, the pagan lifestyle. They're wandering around. They're grumpy. If you've read the passage, they're a little grumpy. Even though they're given food, all the food that they want, wouldn't that be awesome, like Chipotle, anytime you want? I know manna wasn't Chipotle. But they had it. They were, they were taken care of. The Lord was showing them the way. He was caring for their needs. He was loving on them. Everything was good for them, as good as it could be wandering through the wilderness. But because of their sin and their chaos, it actually became evidence. And we have writings that talk about how uh, in the world at that time, really basically it was who can be the most clever liar. And so because of that, the law of Moses again was given because these people's words could not be trusted. There's a different way to live. We have to deal with each other differently. And this law sought to bring the seriousness of their words and agreements that they were having with each other. Because it was common to make an oath for trivial things. Yeah, I swear by this, that I'll, I'll do that. And it didn't matter if you followed through because it's a trivial thing. It doesn't matter. The law was meant to make an oath taking a serious and important matters only. Only if it's significant enough, make the oath that you are going to fulfill the oath. It was meant to be a solemn matter. To take an oath with someone was serious. If someone says, I promise you I will do that, I take that kind of seriously. And when they don't follow through, it does hurt. And I know that I have broken those promises, and I know that it hurts as well. But they were God's people and were reminded that even in their talk and conversation, and especially taking oaths, everything must be done in such a way as to realize, and this is important for us, make sure we hear this, everything must be done in such a way to, as to realize God was looking at them. God was watching them. God was intently among them. And that's why when the passages say, when a man makes a vow to the Lord, he must not break it. That's Numbers 30. If you make a vow to the Lord, your God, do not be slow to repay it. That's Deuteronomy 3, 23. You shall not swear by my name falsely. That's Leviticus 19. The law of Moses made it very, very clear that it's only for significant situations and it's to be followed through with earnestness. But the Pharisees, to show the seriousness of the oath, swear by God. Make sure you make it significant enough, put enough emphasis on it. And then they started to create underneath that over time, if you look through our scripture and other writings that we have around, it became swear by anything you want, just make sure you do it. And then it became really as long as you don't commit perjury most of the time, that's okay. That's what they boiled it down to. The worst thing you could do is commit perjury, the offense of willingly telling an untruth in a court after having taken an oath. This is the worst thing. So if you take me to court and I commit perjury, they actually consider that to be a death sentence for a lot of people. But if you tell me a lie, and it's not a big deal, and we're not under oath in court, I haven't committed perjury, so sorry. They had, com they had turned the law of God into what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to act, how we're supposed to communicate, how we're supposed to care for one another by how we talk to one another, and how we create this mistrust or trust with one another, they had boiled it down to, as long as you're not in court, you're all right. They had turned oath-taking into a confusing and man-made thing. Some oaths were binding while others were not binding. If you took an oath by the temple, that was binding. If you took an oath by the altar, not binding. But if you took an oath by what was on the altar, binding. I'm not, you think I'm kidding, but I'm not. It's actually in Matthew chapter 23. Then Jesus said to the crowd, oh, sorry, uh, woe to, verse 16, woe to you, blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing, but if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred. And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing, but if he swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift uh, by the altar or everything on it. And, whosoever, and whoever swears by the temple swears by it, and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by the heavens swears by the throne of God, and by him who sits upon it. They literally had, if you do this, then you're fine, but if you don't do this, you're, you're here, whatever. The Pharisees, there, were a, there was a distinction between oaths, and with God, there is no distinction between oaths. 
If you're going to give an oath, if you're going to say something, then do it. Some of these are binding, some are not binding. It led to mistrust and oaths in general losing their meaning. In fact, it became less about verifying truthfulness and more about getting away with deceitfulness for the Pharisees. And so what did Jesus teach? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. That's not that complicated. It's really not. Don't lie. How you speak to people matters. If you say yes, yes. Here's another thing. It's okay to say no. And be okay with somebody telling you no. But God made oaths through his covenant. So God did make oaths. He made covenants with people. But again, we're not God. He is faithful always. His motives are righteous. Ours are not. He is our binding. No matter what, he's going to see it through it. Because if he's truly sovereign and is part of his plan, he made the oath, he made the covenant to see it through for his ultimate glory and good of everything. So Jesus was getting at the heart of the matter again. He goes after their ridiculous standards by what they swear by. The gold in the building or the thing on the altar. But it really didn't matter because their heart was never truly pure in what they were making a covenant about anyway. You don't need to take an oath. Just be honest. God in his omniscience and omnipresence knows our thoughts. He knows our actions. He knows our deeds. And so if I'm walking around lying, I may have gotten away with it if I lied to Jake, but I'm not really getting away with it because the Lord knows my heart. When I was younger, I actually was pretty proud of the fact that I had a pretty quick wit and a pretty quick tongue. If we were in an argument, I was going to win. I was going to make sure that I won, whatever it took. And I had a quick wit about it, and I was actually, like, I would lie about things, and I would say certain things. And as I was getting older, like into high school and stuff, I was like, but am I really? And I started to feel this, like, tremendous regret for the fact that I had pride and the fact that I could outwit or out tongue lash anybody so I was a sophomore in high school and uh you know we would we went to church and I was at church and whatever else and our youth pastor goes I just I don't know why but I feel the Lord wanting us to do a study on James oh okay and if you've done a study on James you know that you quickly get into what the tongue and what the the heart is really about as a believer honesty should radiate from the believer Honesty should radiate from the believer because of who they are found in, not because of an oath that they have taken. You don't need to swear by anything. You just need to live as God has called you to live and live out your life, even the mistakes of your life, which is going to happen in a very honest and real way. I don't believe that we're not supposed to swear an oath. I think that you can get up on the stand. You can put your hand on the Bible. You can say, I'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I know that there's groups of people out there like Quakers who don't take oaths, refuse to take oaths, and even in the midst of a trial would probably say that they're not going, most would say, almost all, that they would not take an oath and do that as they're even on trial. But I don't, I don't think it's saying take no oaths. I honestly believe God is getting at the heart, Christ is getting at the heart. Don't make flippant oaths. Don't say you're going to swear by something or you're going to do something if it's not true. What is your heart and your word? Can a lost and dying world trust the words that come out of your mouth? Can they trust the words that you're saying? Can they trust the life that you're living? So that when you do get to the gospel, when you are living side by side, life on life, you are walking with them, you are living a life in which you're trying to disciple and grow people. But if they, again, they can't trust your words in your daily life, how could they ever trust your words about the person who, who, lives, who lives inside of you and who wants to work out your daily life? Clearly, those two things are incompatible. If you're living one way and claiming another, those don't fit. If you own a business, can people trust you to do what you say you're going to do? The people that you work with, they know you go to church. Do they actually trust what you say? Or have you earned a different reputation? In light of all this, it is sin. That's the final expectation. That's the final thing that it is. I will speak better, I will walk better, I will talk to people better if I deal with sin aggressively in my life. That's an outflowing of a changed heart. I will love my spouse differently if I have an outpouring of the truly changed heart by Christ. So I will not lead to divorce. I will not lead to lust and those other things. I will not live with anger in my heart if I truly deal with the sin that is in my life. And so it really boils down to this. It's a master issue. Who's the master of your life? 
Are these things mastering you and leading you down a path for sin in these things? Or are you giving those things out to the Lord to truly be the master of your life? If it's you, you're going to pursue your lusts, you're going to pursue lies, you're going to pursue desires, you're going to pursue sin. And if it's God and you truly are pursuing him, he's going to root those things out of you and you will live differently. Not perfectly, but differently. All for his glory and for your good. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. Lord, again, as always, I pray that nothing but what you have for us was heard. I pray, Lord, that you would do the work. I know, Spirit, uh, if you are a believer in here, the Spirit lives inside of you, wants to change you, wants to make you, wants to mold you more into the image of the Father as we are supposed to be. Lord, I pray that you would do the work in each one of our lives to deal with and root out our sin, that we would take it seriously, that we don't see these things as individual issues, and I have different ones than someone else, but God, honestly, we see it as overall it's a sin issue, and we need to get rid of it. We need to kill it. We need to stop playing with it, and we need to make real decisions based on real truth only found in you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.